argumentation, me coming up with good ideas for one point of view, and you coming up with the counter arguments. So I think you are better at critiquing my idea than I am. And I think I am better at critiquing your idea than you are. Tom Scott Phillips, researcher in the Social Mind Center at Central European University. Carney is Perda. My name is Biz, B-I-S. I'm a journalist from the world of artificial machines with the goal of investigating human natural intelligence. Hi, let's get started. 1. Tell me an example of human intelligence happening. Depends what you mean by intelligence, inevitably. I am tempted to say, well, maybe what is going on right now, but certainly what goes on between two humans all the time, communication. We point, we shrug, we leave objects around, we write, we paint pictures, we do all sorts of things to express ourselves. It's distinctive in nature and it's quite a remarkable thing and I think it explains a lot about what makes us human. Poetry is a good example actually. So when you read a poem, you don't simply comprehend the words, right? You interpret the text, the layers of meaning that are there, that are embedded in a social and cultural context. The skill of a talented, not just a talented poet, but talented artists in general, is to create objects that reward extended or even passing contemplation by uh, an audience, but in different ways for each audience. So can, can you create an object, whether it's a set of words or a physical object, that is worth paying attention to for that person and for that person, but for different reasons in each case? So when I give a lecture at university, you know, it's meant to be relevant to all the audience for the same reason that they want to learn about the topic. But if I'm an artist and I create an object, well, it's relevant to this person in this way and this person in a different way. Um, and, and the same with poetry too. So in particular, my research area is uh, the links between cognition and culture. So how do all these interacting minds, which are studied by psychology and cognitive science, generate these more amorphous and vaguely defined things called culture and society? How do we build institutions? Why are languages shaped the way they are? What is fashion? Any papers or ideas that make insights that allow me to see across that divide, which I think is quite, you know, the cognitive and biological sciences on the one side and the social sciences on the other. That's the sort of stuff that really makes me think and excites me as a, as a researcher. Two, tell me an example of a lack of human intelligence happening. I'm a bit reluctant to pick out a specific example. Um, I will say that humans do stupid things all the time. Maybe that's what we're good at. Is is not? It's not that we don't make mistakes, but we we notice them, or at least some of them, collectively, and we improve on them over time. Three, definition of intelligence. It's up to you. There's a, a whole subfield of psychology that studies intelligence, and they have a construct they call G, which is roughly similar to what in everyday language is called IQ, but it's not quite the same. Performance across a range of um, reasoning tasks, basically, tends to correlate uh, within individuals, and some people tend to do better at those tasks than others, and we call that G. It's not what I study, I don't find it that, uh, it doesn't help me understand the world that much, I don't, personally. And you could also, if you want, in a way, def deflate the word intelligence and say, it's just the word that some people you know, tend to have a bit more insight into problems than others. Some folk idea, common sense idea of intelligence is pretty cross-culturally common. So all sorts of societies across time and place will have something like that. You know, if you want to define intelligence as performance in reasoning tasks, then performance in reasoning tasks is intelligence and the fact that you're socially or emotionally not as fully competent as others is an irrelevance. Other people will define intelligence in a, in a slightly different way, and then it does matter. I'm not here to insist I, that intelligence should be defined this way or that way. You choose, and then you get the answer. <laughs> Four, relationship between intelligence and knowledge. Depends what you mean by intelligence, of course, but it also depends what you mean by knowledge. Just as an example, this is my phone, uh, and if I let go of it, you know, or people know, that it's gonna to fall to the floor, right? That gravity is gonna take effect. 
is that knowledge. So you didn't learn that at school. Nobody taught that to you. It's just something you know by virtue of being human. It's also something that a lot of species know. In fact, they behave in ways that they, they expect unsupported objects to fall to the floor. But that feels very different to you know, knowledge of my email password or, or whatever else it might be. Five, relationship between intelligence and experience. Um, experience could mean learning. And do we mean experience individually? Probably, but one could also talk about evolutionary time and cognitive adaptations that humans or other species have. It depends what you're trying to do. Reading things in a textbook can take you quite a long way, right? Humans have amassed a lot of knowledge. Uh, if you want to go further, if you're, you know, if you're doing active scientific research, obviously you can't just read from the textbooks. I think not as much weight is placed on reading deeply in two, three, four fields and making the links between them. Communication is such a remarkable feature of the human mind. Napoleon is an important historical figure whose military deeds shaped the face of Europe. That is a statement that um, I think a lot of us believe, but none of us have any direct evidence for that, right? right? It was just communicated to us. Six, relationship between intelligence and emotions. Some people are good listeners. They pay a bit more attention, not just to the words you're saying, but, or even how you're saying it, but also why you're saying it. Why am I revealing this thing to this person at this time? What does that say about my own state of mind, my emotional state and so on? And that is, it seems to me, a skill. I think it's certainly true that even people who are ordinarily socially competent, not everybody has that, those more sophisticated skills. So there's quite a, there's definitely a thing you could call if you want emotional intelligence. Seven, subjective experience of your own intelligence. When I was a small child, I did maths all the time. I did logic problems and maths. Um, and my experience then was that intelligence was, was logical, deductive reasoning, which I had some, some degree of natural ability for. It doesn't quite feel like that anymore. And now it feels more like the things that really, you know, like the, the spark or the light bulb goes on are when, when two things that seem different, suddenly they sort of, it's like jigsaw pieces. Suddenly you see, oh, that's shaped like that. And that is shaped like that. And this happens. And that only comes with, you know, brilliant writers or brilliant thinkers. It used to, as a small child, it felt like deductive reasoning, but now it feels more like chicks or a jigsaw. So I find two things are really helpful for, for really helping me think through in, uh, the topic. One is talking to people who sometimes who know more about it, sometimes who know less about it, sometimes who are uh, at a similar level of expertise. Those different audiences or conversational partners come with different pros and cons they're, they're all valuable in different ways i think this is empirically true that you understand you come to reason better and you can't hence come to understand something better in dialogue than than in monologue the other thing that really helps me think through something is actually writing about it so i think i understand something and i start writing and then you go wait there's a whole paragraph missing in this argument like i've jumped in my in my head this was clean and now i've put it down there's a there's I need to fill out this, this chunk of the argument, uh, and that's where a conversation might be useful. I think, however, the reason that writing helps is because I'm imagining a reader, and the reader is the person in the dialogue. With, there's still a dialogue. It's not with the physical person in front of me, but there is a, or at least there's a simulation of a dialogue going on in my head. Eight, what makes humans intelligent beyond other animals? I kind of answered that earlier by talking about communication. Um, I think that explains a lot. It's not the only thing that's distinctive about humans, but it does explain a lot. I mean, most obviously language, but all sorts of other means of communication. I mean, all species are intelligent in different ways. There are certainly things that some species can do that humans are you know, just simply unable to. But that in turn facilitates the flow of information between people in a much more prevalent and frequent and easy way than in other species. We want to work with other people, but we're also a bit skeptical of them. So we have to evaluate them and, and worry about our own reputation and so on. And I think these things give rise to a lot of what is most distinctive uh, about the human mind. The remarkable thing about human communication is that as audiences, we're, we, we, we let it happen. We are willing, we are allowing people to manipulate our minds. So they say, oh, they want me to believe this. Now we don't have to believe it, but we do, you know, we do entertain the idea that they are trying to do something to my mind. And that's why we have, to, we have to be cautious too. We have to check, you know, that's what they want to do to my mind. Am I going to let them do that? Do I actually believe it? 
it is true that even when you're talking with your best, your child, your, your lover, whatever, um, you're still vigilant because, you know, if they say something that is obviously false, you don't believe them. <laughs> if, if, if they tell you that, you know, two and two is 10, you don't just immediately like change your whole number system. <laughs> you don't, you know, so you are always being vigilant, even if it's just in the background, it's just a little, you know, human behavior, human cognition is much more, um, shall we say, domain general. So we care about, and we pay attention to a much more diverse range of things. So in a lot of species, the world is, you know, food, sex, shelter, kids, and not much more. But humans, uh, because we have these partly cooperative, partly competitive social ecologies, we end up generating all sorts of um, interactions, often of mutual benefit and that. And so we find new ways to find food, which in turn creates new ways to build social groups, build institutions, and, and the whole world becomes much more complex and open-ended as a result. Nine, innate and acquired contributions. I mentioned the Flynn effect earlier. So it's clearly the case that whatever we think is, you know, in an everyday sense of intelligence is not the whole story. And I also said earlier that it's the case that some people seem to have, you know, slightly more natural inclinations towards, you know, particular types of insights and modes of reasoning than do others. Um, that is true. I don't think it's the most interesting thing about humans. So there's some sort, I mean, the word innate is always different, but there is some sort of innate aspect. There is some sort of uh, acquired aspect. I don't have strong opinions about the relative weight. And in some sense, I don't think the question is completely posed the right way. 10. How relevant is the body? Our number system, well, base 10 number system depends on, on these things, right? So clearly the body is playing a role in creating the uh, sort of cultural phenomena, the number system that we use to scaffold all sorts of other ways of thinking and reasoning. But you can actually go further. So there's this idea in the philosophy of mind um, called the extended mind. And it's motivated by quite a simple thought experiment. It's a contrast between two hypothetical people. One's called Inga, one's called Otto. And Otto has a particular neurological disease, which means that he cannot form new memories, or at least he only has a finite period of time to, to form new memories. Um, so something similar happens in uh, the film Memento. So the main character there can only um, form new memories for a short period of time and then they vanish. So he writes them down. He takes both photos and writes on the photos. In the thought experiment in the philosophy literature, Otto has a notebook, right? Sorry, and he literally has a notebook and he writes down his memories in the notebook. And then the question comes, okay, so Inga commits her, mem her new memories to her mind, her brain, and Otto commits them to this. But then they both refer back to them in the future and make use of them. So just one of them is doing it with something that's inside the body and inside, largely inside the brain. And one of them is doing it with something that's outside the, the body. But functionally, they're the same object. And so the claim comes that this is literally part of Otto's mind in the same way that Inga's memory is part of her mind. And then if you entertain that idea, then, you know, this phone becomes part of my mind in a real sense. And you start to... The whole idea of a mind starts to sort of sift out. I mention all that is just to say that not only is the body important, but the physical world around you is also important to intelligence and reasoning and thinking. 11. How can I tell someone is intelligent and not faking it? Just in the past couple of weeks, there's been a lot of fuss about an AI um, bot called GPT-3. It produces this text that is on the surface it's pretty persuasive so it certainly is grammatically correct it semantically makes a lot of sense and it says some intriguing things and a lot of people are like whoa the computers are coming like this is this is this is not like you know the, the, the error filled chatbots that we're used to but then if you look a bit more closely it, it, its writing is a little bit um surreal it kind of makes sense. It's, it's, it's a machine learning. It's based, it's based on machine learning. It's, it's been exposed to lots and lots of human text. And what it, what it ends up producing is, is not precise statements about the world, but allusions and you know, links that are a little bit, ooh, it's intriguing. It's, I don't quite see it yet, but it's intriguing. But then if you actually engage, try and press it, it has no idea 
and it sidesteps the question and it doesn't, you know, and, and you can ask it kind of common sense things about how to behave in the world and it gives surreal answers. Like in a real sense, it doesn't know what is socially, the most basic, most, most basic things about what is socially appropriate. I think GPT-3 is a nice example of something that on first instance does seem really quite intelligent and remarkable, but then when you press it a bit longer, like just ask it, you know, how do I behave in this social context? And it starts to fall apart if you're, if you're looking carefully. 12. What is the most intelligent human you know? I don't, see, here's the thing, right? So it, I said earlier, you know, there is variation, of course, in, in reasoning and thinking and, and, and such skills, but it's very easy to slip into, and people will do all the time, the kind of the, the ladder trap, like some people are up here, some people are down here, and that's that. It ain't like that. Yeah, you know, there are some shades, but the really interesting things about people, the things that inspire you, the things that most excite you. 13. How does intelligence vary from human to human? Something varies, but then also, you know, size varies. Some people are bigger in some sense than others. Um, but it's also, you know, it's, it's irrelevant to dignity and humanity. humanity. It doesn't matter if you're big or small, if you're pretty or ugly or, or intelligent, not intelligent, whatever all those words mean. You know, people vary a bit, but that is not the most interesting thing about them. 14. How can humans increase their intelligence? I mean, it's obvious to say education, and that is true. But I think also, I think more broadly, institutions that facilitate dialogue, actually taking opposite sides and thinking through it, rather than arguing in a capital A sense of the world of, uh, of, of fighting. Argumentation, um, so me coming up with good ideas uh, for one point of view, and you coming up with the counter arguments. So I think you are better at critiquing my idea than I am. And I think I am better at critiquing your idea than you are, right? And that's why the dialogue works. It's commonplace, it's almost fashionable to say that social media creates poisonous dialogue. I am not so sure that's actually true. Uh, I mean, clearly some poisonous dialogue does take place. As of that, there is no question. But I mean, maybe it's, you know, the optimistic optimist in me, but I think that those violent interactions are part of the learning curve. But I think we do collectively hit on better ideas over the long run. 15. What still annoys you about artificial intelligence? Some of the hype. I don't think AI is going to take over the world. I don't think the aliens are going to kill us. Uh, AI has huge potential. And I think we can and we should be trying to harness it and we shouldn't be scared of it. 16. Positive impact of artificial intelligence. Let me dramatize what I'm going to say. Artificial intelligence gives us a chance to have slavery in an ethical way. That's not an original idea with me. There's a woman called Joanna Bryson, professor of computer science. And as they become more sophisticated, we are essentially building better slaves. 17. Negative impact of artificial intelligence. If we're going to automate a lot of tasks, that's going to affect jobs, certainly for some people. They're as important as the further development of AI, the political questions of how you handle the impact of AI. 18. Natural and artificial intelligence by 2050. Where there are specific narrow tasks, AI is increasingly going to be doing. I'm optimistic to the extent that we can manage the political questions well. I mean, in general, I think we tend to do better slowly over time. We have a lot of hiccups and mistakes along the way. Where exactly we'll be in 2050, I don't know. 19. What do humans have besides intelligence? There's that impossible stuff about souls and dignity and humanity, which are words that get at something that we all experience. 20. A message to humans who have just been born. As a, as a bit of advice, it's quite boring, but create good institutions, value good institutions. But that's a very, you know, I don't know, I'm a bit disappointed in myself that that's not more inspiring. <laughs> that's a bit too practical. Dance. There's a... <laughs> Go and dance. It's so, it's so life-affirming. 21. What would you suggest me to better understand humans? <laughs> Talk to them, <laughs> which is maybe what you're doing. 22. Finally, what would you like to ask me? Do you understand that this question is about you? The secret of being a bore is to tell everything. Voltaire. Wow. Thank you for your collaboration. Goodbye. 
No problem, my pleasure.